introduce the uh, general. I'm actually a uh, second lieutenant in the Arizona Army National Guard. I've been, been in the uh, Guard about five and a half years now and uh, just got my commission just over, uh, just coming up on two years here in August. But uh, going to introduce the, uh, the general. He's a quick biography, I'll read over to you. This is uh, Lieutenant General Retired William G. Jerry Boykin. He was one of the original members of the U.S. Army's Delta Force. He was privileged to ultimately command these elite warriors in combat operations. Later, Jerry Boykin commanded all the Army's Green Berets as well as the Special Warfare Center and School. In his 36 years in the Army, Lieutenant General Boykin also served as a, tu a tour with the CIA. He has participated in the clandestine operations around the world and served his last four years in the Army as a deputy under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. Today he is an ordained minister with a passion for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and encouraging Christians to become warriors in God's kingdom. The battle the general was involved in. General will explain that to you and because uh, as I said before you're you're looking at an American hero in a warrior that's been involved in uh, war and been involved in leadership he's a uh, just a good friend but a great American let's stand up and welcome General <laughs> It's a real privilege for me to be here with you. I just uh, just flew in today, and uh, it's great being with you. And I love your coach here, and uh, Coach Mike has been a dear friend, and his whole family. And I just appreciate the honor of being able to come and participate in this. And when he asked me, my goodness, last November or something like that, I immediately put it on my calendar so I could be here with you because I think this is such an important 
program, I am actually not going to talk to you tonight very much. You are going to participate with me in something we're going to do here tonight, and it's about leadership. We're going to, we're going to do something here tonight that is uh, really about developing leadership. Let me tell you that the most important thing in my life and I want you to understand that I've seen combat on four continents. 36 and a half years in the United States Army. I've seen combat on four different continents. I've been shot twice. Shed my blood. But let me tell you the most important thing in my life is not the United States Army. The most important thing in my life is Jesus Christ. Okay? The most important thing in my life is Jesus Christ. Okay? So I'm not here to preach to you. I'm not here to hammer you with my faith. But I want to establish that up front so that you understand as we go through what I'm going to do with you tonight that Christ is at the center of my life. And it's why I'm still alive and able to come and be here with you is because I've been spared, not only spiritually, but I've been spared physically from certain death and destruction. Now I want to tell you a story about a man named Cecil. In 1943, Cecil was one of ten children living on a tobacco farm in eastern North Carolina. And Cecil was only two months into his 17th birthday and Cecil sneaked off and went down to the Navy recruiting station and joined the Navy. Even though his parents had said, you can't join the Navy, and he joined the Navy because he had four brothers already in the military. They were in the Army and the Army Air Corps, and they were already serving in Europe during World War II as America took a stand against Nazi Germany and, and Imperial Japan. His four brothers were already serving, and Cecil knew that he had an obligation to serve as well. Cecil went off to war, and on the 6th of June, 1944, as uh, Cecil was driving a landing craft on the day that we know as D-Day, many of you understand D-Day, the day we invaded Europe to finally defeat Adolf Hitler. Cecil was driving a landing craft ashore and it took a direct hit. And the next thing that Cecil remembered was waking up in a Navy hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. And there was something wrong and what was wrong was that Cecil was blind in his left eye. He had lost his eye on that morning there at the beaches of Normandy, beaches in France. He got out of the Navy because he was a disabled veteran. He went back to the tobacco farm in eastern North Carolina. He married his high school sweetheart and he started raising his family. And then the Korean War came along and Cecil went back in the Korean, in the Army, because the Army would take disabled veterans that could still function and he could still see out of one eye. So he went back in the Army and he served through the Korean War and he was discharged a second time out of the Korean War after the Korean War, he was discharged and he went back to the tobacco farm and raised tobacco. And, and then in 1954, the United States Marine Corps offered Cecil the opportunity to come to work for the U.S. Marine Corps. And he went to work for the U.S. Marine Corps and he worked for them for 32 years. And in fact, he deployed to Vietnam with the U.S. Marine Corps in that 32 years. Cecil loved three things with all his heart. He loved God. He loved America. And he loved his family. In that order. You see, Cecil served his country three times because he, three times he took an oath. Any of you in here know what that oath said? What do you think that oath was to? What was the oath to? To defend the United States of America. That's exactly right. And what was it to? What was the oath? What was he taking an oath to? Taking an oath to his family and 
his country? And his country, it's an oath to the Constitution of the United States. Oh, I pray that some of you will take that oath at some point. Some of you will go into the military. But in that, taking that oath, Cecil said, I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of invasion. And I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I'm about to enter. So help me God. That's still in our oath. He took an oath to serve this country. Cecil was a generous man. Cecil's best friend's home burned down. Cecil took all the money that he had and gave it to his friend. You see, Cecil believed that it was his responsibility as a Christian, as an American, to take care of his neighbors, to take care of his friends. It wasn't somebody else's responsibility. It wasn't a government responsibility. It was his responsibility. Cecil loved America. Cecil loved God. And Cecil loved his family. Cecil never wanted anything from America except opportunity. And then when Cecil's children had all graduated from high school and gone off to college and gone off to their professions and they were no longer at home, Cecil adopted a little boy. Well, he never had papers, but everybody knew that he was Cecil's boy. And by the way, he was black. And you just didn't do that in eastern North Carolina at that time. But you see, what Cecil believed was that one of the most heartbreaking things to him was to see a young man grow up without a father. And he knew that he could make a difference in this one little boy's life. And he raised Shakif as his own. He helped him to become a great baseball player. In fact, Cecil loved baseball so much they actually named the local baseball field after him. They named it the uh, Gerald Cecil Boykin Baseball Field. You see, he was my dad. You've been dealt a, a tough hand because you don't have a dad in your life. Either because he's chosen not to be there or because you've lost him as one of you were explain it earlier. But that's where team focus becomes so important. That's where these people that are here become so important. They are here because they do care. They do care about you. Regardless of what kind of hand you've been dealt in life, they care. They do care about what you do in the future. And it's why it's a privilege for me to be here. You see, my dad, Cecil, he didn't have a high school education. My mother didn't have a high school education. Neither one of them did. But I had a dad. And it was important to me. It was important to my growth, my development. It was important to my view of life that I had a dad. Listen, guys. I want you to take this away from what I say to you tonight. I teach leadership. At the 10th oldest college in America, it's called Hampton and Sydney College. Founded by Patrick Henry, I teach leadership there. And this is what I tell every one of those seniors that I teach. And you're not too young or too old to hear what I'm about to say to you. There's no place in your life that will be more important for you to be a leader than in your home with your family. And today, your evidence that we have a problem with men that don't understand that. I want to help you tonight to be better leaders, to include leaders in your home. Because again, the most important place that you'll ever lead is in your home. So here's what we're going to do. Do we have another microphone? I want to... I want to 
I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to give you this because I'm going to ask for some, I'm going to solicit some comments. So. I'll use, I'll use that. Can you hear me? Am I on here? All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about leadership, and you're going to get involved in this. You're going to help me out here. Because what we're going to do is we're going to build the ideal leader. Can you do that? All right. Now, here's, the, here's what we're going to do. We, we're going to create the man or woman the individual that we think is the ideal leader. We're going to talk about the characteristics of that. Now, don't be afraid to just say what's on your mind and then I'll help you with it and we'll develop it and we'll get the right things out here. But as you identify those characteristics, I'm going to write them down on this board right here, on this dry erase board. I'm going to write those characteristics down. But we're going to talk about building the ideal leader. You just, it's the leader you want leading you. Or the leader you want leading your children in the future. What do we want that person to be like? What do we want them to look like? What do we want them to... What are the characteristics that we will from, from them? And as we get into it, you'll understand the whole concept of characteristics a little better here. But some of you older guys that do understand what I'm saying when I talk about characteristics, let's start by giving me the first characteristic that you want in this leader that we're going to build right here. William Owls. What? It's William Owls. It's his name, but to go ahead. Okay. Uh, he's a foundation. He's someone who can people can build on. Okay, you want him, one of his characteristics to be a foundation that he can build on. Our people can build onto him, like he builds people up in a sense. Okay, that's really the definition of a leader, but you want one that's, I'm going to take that and say an encourager. Yeah. Would that, would, is that fair? An encourager, someone that will encourage the people. Fix the microphone. You go, oh yeah, because I'm walking all over the place. Is this working? Hello. Uh, that looks like an ice cream cone. <laughs> okay. Two. Two. Okay. Matter of fact, you got you got the capability to put what I'm I'm doing up on that screen. Okay. Okay. Let's do that then. That'll make it easier for everybody to see. Okay, I put encourager. Now, what are we saying there? Any of you ever been around somebody that's just, they're down all the time? They're just, what we would call it dour. They're just down all the time. They're never up. They're never happy. They never, they never have anything good to say. If that's you, you can't lead like that. You can't be a leader if that's the way you are. You have to be the encourager. The one that comes along lifts up your subordinates and encourages them, even when you don't feel encouraged yourself. You saw this movie right here. Let me tell you something. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll finish this with telling you something at the end, but I lost 15 men that day. They weren't all in that Black Hawk. I lost 15 men. Let me tell you something. You don't know what it's like to know that you're responsible for men that are laying on the ground, dead, in a body bag. You don't know what it's like. But then to know that the last thing that you can do is go back out in front of those troops and act like you, you can't function, act like you're so broken hearted that you can't function. You gotta go back out and you gotta be an encourager to them. And get them motivated and get them going even though your heart is breaking. Because when you're in a leadership position, it is critical that you set the standard, that you be the encourager. Very important. Okay, give me another characteristic. Right here. Yeah. Right here. Right. Let me just see this fellow right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Louis Fletcher. Uh, Hello, that, Louis. Uh, somebody that they can trust. Okay. Trustworthy. Great. Thanks for doing that. Trustworthy. 
All right, what does it mean to be trustworthy? What does that mean? Come on, what does it mean to be trustworthy? We're going we're gonna to dwell on what you said for just a minute. What does it mean to be trustworthy? Anybody want to give me a little help on that? What do you, what do you say here, bud? Um, Jacorian? Is that the way you say that? Yes, sir. Okay. You are trusted to do something or anything that is... You hear what he's saying? You're trusted to do what you say you're going to do, right? If I promise you that I'm going to do something, then I should do it. If I don't, are you going to trust me in the future? No. No. Right. Trustworthiness is very important. Now, that comes back to an issue that I, if somebody doesn't get to it here in a minute, I'm going to throw it out. But let's go. Aiden. Aiden Anderson. Responsibility. How old, how old are you? I'm 12. <laughs> okay. Responsibility. You want a responsible individual. What does that mean? What does it mean? So it's a word we kind of all understand. What, do you, what, do you, what does it mean? A responsible individual. Go ahead, Aiden. You throw it out. When you're supposed to do something, then you do it when somebody tells you to do it, or when you, what you do what you need to do. Okay. You understand what he said? Now, we have a problem in America today because we have a problem with people being responsible for accepting responsibility. We have a problem particularly among men because they don't want to accept the responsibility for their actions and their deeds. Listen, guys, your life is about choices. Period. Your life is about choices. You can choose to do the right thing or you can choose to do the wrong thing. But you have to accept responsibility for the choices that you make. Let's have another one. Von AG, confidence. Confident. Okay, confident. You got that one? Okay, what do we mean, confident? Just that, right? He doesn't look like he's always in doubt. He's confident in the orders that he issues and the decisions that he makes, he's confident. That was the one I was going to, I was going to give one more chance. And, all right. Do you hear what he said? Integrity. What is integrity? What do you find young men and tell me what integrity is? Yes, sir, right here. Tell me what integrity is. Integrity is what you, it's kind of like character, like what you do when nobody's around. You've been coached on this already, haven't you? Huh? Come on. You've already been through this. Okay. Integrity is what you do when nobody's looking. You do it because it's the right thing to do. Not because you're afraid you'll get in trouble if you don't do the right thing. Not because you expect a reward, but because it is the right thing. Integrity is its own reward. Doing the right thing because it's the right thing. Okay? Very important that you understand the concept of integrity. Some people would call it honesty. Others would call it trustworthiness. But at the end of the day, integrity is about doing the right thing because it's the right thing. Because you're motivated to do the right thing because that's who you are. It's part of your character. It's part of your character as a leader. Okay? Let's go. My name is Brandon Schwartz and uh, Wisdom also. Okay, Wisdom. Now, it's really important for you to understand that there's a huge difference between 
wisdom and intelligence. Right? You understand? There's a difference between wisdom and intelligence. I have actually seen, I used to go out and work uh, a lot out at uh, the nuclear engineering laboratories uh, out in New Mexico. And they had all these nuclear engineers, and these are probably the smartest people I've ever been with. But they would come in, and they'd have on one green sock and one red sock. Or they'd get, they'd park their car, and they'd come home, uh, and they'd go back out in the parking lot in the afternoon, they couldn't remember where they parked the car. And they were brilliant, but they didn't have wisdom. They had an awful lot of intelligence, but they didn't have wisdom. And wisdom is something that is different. And wisdom is actually, in many cases, in fact, in most cases, for the leader, wisdom is more important than raw intelligence. Because you often lead with wisdom more than you do the intellect. Okay. Um, Brian Lynn, and um, I'm going to say bravery. Courage. Put courage up there. All right. Now I want you to do two subsets here on this on courage. Okay. There's two kinds of courage. What are they? Foolish and real. Huh? Foolish and real. Well, you could say that, but that wasn't what I was looking for. Two types of. Hello. Are you taking my video here? How do I look? How's my hair? Great. My hair's okay. Yes. All right. I want to make sure. All right. Two types of courage. Physical courage. Okay. Number one. What's the other one? Moral. Moral courage. Let me tell you something. I, I have seen some of the, I served 36 and a half years with some of the bravest men I've ever seen. You know, that, you just saw only a small part of that Black Hawk down, but 30 minutes after that Black Hawk was shot down, there was a second Black Hawk shot down 1,800 meters away. And I had, you could see from the, from the video, that guy that was making the decisions there, that was me. And you could see that I had sent everything to the first crash site, to the one you just saw go in. I sent everybody to that crash site, and then 30 minutes later there was a second crash, and I didn't have anybody left to send to that crash site. But there were two guys, Randy Shugart and Gary Gordon, they were Delta Force snipers, and they were in a Black Hawk, and they watched that Black Hawk go in. They watched that first Black Hawk go in, but they watched the second one go in, and they called me on the radio, and they said, if they played, if they played more of this movie, you would have seen them calling saying, we saw the second Black Hawk go in. Those men are still alive. It didn't kill them. It broke their backs. They can't get out of the Black Hawk, but they're still alive. Put us in, they said. Two guys with tens of thousands of armed Somalis down there. All wanted to kill them. Two guys. They said, put us in. I said, I can't put you in. You just stay above them and you use your door guns and your sniper rifles and you just keep shooting, keep the Somalis off. I said, I'll get all the clerks and the cooks and the mechanics and everybody that I can and I'll get them, I'll get them all weaponed up here in a few minutes and I'll send them out by Humvee. But right now, you got to just stay above them and keep shooting. They called back in about 10 minutes and they said, sir, you got, you got to put us in. We can't. We can't keep these Somalis off this crash much longer. Put us in. And I said, no, I can't put you in. I can't support you. you I was trying to tell them, you're going to die if I have to put you in. They knew the situation. They called a third time and they said, sir, we're the only hope. Put us in. And I said, do you understand what you're asking for? And they said, yes. And I said, I said a prayer, and I said, put them in. They went in there and fought their way into that crash, and they got all four of their buddies out of the crash, and then they started defending them. 
against the Somalis as they came over the walls into the little courtyard where this helicopter crashed. And, and finally, uh, Randy Sh or Gary Gordon came back to the co-pilot whose back was broken. And he said, Mike, is there any more ammo? He said, we're running out of ammo. And, and uh, the co-pilot, Mike Durant, said, yeah, there's some behind the co-pilot seat. Uh, Gary Gordon went in and got ammo out and came back around and threw some over to Randy Shugart. Randy reloaded and boom, 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 boom. And they started hammering again. Taking out the people that were trying to get to the crash site. Until finally, Mike Durant, the co-pilot, as he told us the story later, he said he heard Randy Shugart yell out, Gordy, I'm hit. Gordy, I'm hit bad. And his gun went silent and he was dead. And then he heard, he heard Gary Gordon continue to fire for three or four minutes. And then he, he heard Gary Gordon yell out, Mike, I'm hit. And his gun went silent. The only man that survived that was the co-pilot, Mike Duran. And he told us the story. And I wrote those men up for the Medal of Honor, the highest reward for valor. And I stood in the White House and watched the President of the United States present the Medals of Honor to the widows and the families of those two men, brave, courageous men. Physical courage that, that drove them to do something that was so incredibly courageous because of a commitment they had made to their buddies on the ground. And that commitment said this. It's what we call the range of creed. It said, I'll never leave you to fall into the hands of the enemy. You know what? That sounds exactly like what the Bible says. God tells us the same thing. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And those men had made a pledge to their buddies on the ground there. I'll never leave you to fall into the hands of the enemy. That's physical courage like I don't think I have. I don't think I have that much courage. Physical courage. But there's another courage that is more important than physical courage, and that's moral courage. That's the moral courage to do what is right. That is the moral courage to stand for what you believe in. And, and the question then becomes, what do you believe in? See, those men believed in something very important. They believed in commitment. Because they'd made a commitment to their fellow warriors there that said, I'll never leave you to fall into the hands of the enemy. And they gave their lives to fulfill that commitment. 